think of the pyramids? It's amazing. The scale is more than I expected it to be. It's gorgeous and humbling. It's incredible. I can't believe we're, we get to be here. Welcome back to Finding Gina Marie, where we share our lives as full-time travelers and the connections we make along the way. If you're new here, I'm Judy. And I'm Kevin. Welcome. We're here on our rooftop patio for our Airbnb in Giza, and you can see and hear the sights and sounds of this very bustling city behind us. So let's talk location. We are staying in a small city called Mohandasin, and it is in Giza. It's only about a 15 minute drive to West Cairo, which is an island in the middle of the Nile, and then another 15 minutes to get into downtown Cairo on a good day without traffic. If we were to come back, I think that we would stay in an area that we're visiting quite a bit called Zamalek. Most of what is around us is residential areas with street food, but we have to walk a bit to get to restaurants. So we've been taking Uber rides to Zamalek. And that's a nice quiet place, as quiet as Cairo and Egypt yeah. It's not quiet at all. One of the advantages that it has, though, is that it's got a busier restaurant scene. Mohandasin, though, is really affordable. So we would highly recommend, if you're on a budget, you consider staying here, and the people are fabulous, so that part won't disappoint you. Yeah, there is a section of town that's a little more touristy, that has uh, more of the restaurants, and you can stay closer to that if you're not into the rustic areas that we are enjoying. At the end, we'll talk to you about how much we paid for our Airbnb and some of the other prices that we've seen around the city. First thing you notice when you come into this area is the traffic. Just getting from the airport to here, we know is the crazy chaos that's on the roads. We weren't really prepared for all of the construction or all of the trash that is around. There isn't a formalized system that we can see for trash pickup. So there's a lot of litter everywhere. But um, we also have seen people cleaning up their commercial establishments outside. If they have tile out in front or some sort of sidewalk in front of their establishment, they're definitely keeping that clean. If they just have like dirt that's pounded down, they're spraying it down because dust is a huge problem around here. Our patio is full of it. There are tons of stray dogs and cats everywhere. The dogs really aren't barking a lot and they really keep to themselves. They aren't coming by looking to get pet or anything like that. You'll see them on top of cars. You'll see them in just groups just laying around sunning themselves. And the cats are the same way. There'll be four or five cats just in one spot. They'll be just running in front of you. There, There's animals everywhere. And really, that's kind of where the trash goes sometimes. They're eating out of the trash. You can expect to see goats and lambs and... Donkeys pulling carts. And with all that comes the thing that comes with animals, which is animal waste. Just gotta be careful about where you're walking. If you notice the birds behind us that are flying in a circle, there is an apartment across the way where someone has some sort of chicken coop or, or pigeon coop up on top of the building. And so every time the birds land on that, when he's going to feed whatever's inside there we can't see, he shoos all the birds away and they do this cycle of flying over and over on top of us. There are a lot of people in this city and you really can't go into any side street or any main street without seeing someone. They're either peeking out of their doorways or they're just literally sitting on the ground or they're sitting on curbs. People are everywhere all the time. It's very entrepreneurial too. You will see somebody just pull together a bunch of odds and ends and just be selling it in front of them, sitting on the ground and with their displays, not even on a blanket or anything else. They're just trying to sell what they can. There's a ton of convenience stores. You can't go three blocks without seeing one or two of them. And there's a ton of food vendors selling not just street food, but also selling fruit. And, and there's some guy who comes by with a donkey and selling different kinds of fruits and vegetables and is shouting for people to come out and take a look at his wares. And any time of day, there are people just in no rush to do anything. They're hanging out in restaurants and um, playing backgammon or dominoes or Egyptian games. And, and it's just a casual energy here. We love walking, so whenever we go to a new city, we try to be in a central area where we can walk around. And walking around the Mohandasian area is pretty easy unless you get to a highway. 
And then and there's a lot of highways. There's a lot of highways, so you're kind of blocked off. And when you walk up to a highway, you're going to see people just running across the street. Or not really running, walking. Yeah, I would run across the street. They're walking casually as the cars almost hit them. You know, you've got motorcycles coming out of nowhere. They're not wearing helmets. They may have two or three people on the motorcycle. Or, more shockingly, they may have big boxes that they're carrying. It's amazing how many things they've loaded on motorcycles around here. Uh, people aren't wearing seat belts. Ubers don't even have them available. And sometimes what they do is because of all of the uh, dirt and dust, they cover their seats with plastic and the seat belts are underneath. And so yeah. there's no way to use them. But I really wish it wouldn't be that way because traffic is a madhouse. Now, to be fair, with all this chaos and all this traffic, if, if you come here, you, you really need to experience this. I didn't see as many accidents as I've seen in San Francisco. So I don't know how they're doing it. I don't know what the, the language is with the horns and everything else, but they do an amazing job for all the chaotic driving that they do. Some of the buses will literally stop in the middle of the highway and let people off. And there will be people who stand in the middle of the highway. And we even saw a motorcyclist stop and give someone a free ride on a motorcycle. And that happens actually fairly frequently. It's just random strangers helping one another out. Egyptian culture seems to be help others. So they really do that. So let's talk about the Nile. You can take a ferry, which is five Egyptian pounds per person, and that operates 24 hours a day. If there is ever anyone who tells you that it's more than that, or that it doesn't run 24 hours, they're giving you misinformation. And you can't always trust a Google Maps or Apple Maps. They don't give you a lot of good information for walking, but there are ways to walk across things. There are pedestrian walk bridges over some of the highways, and when you're going across the Nile to get on either side from Giza to West Cairo or Cairo, or West Cairo to Cairo proper, there are ways to get across when you walk. You just have to find the steps that go up onto the bridges for the cars, and there'll be a lane for pedestrians that you can walk across. We've learned from a lot of our Uber drivers and the tour drivers that we've had that tuk-tuks are not loved around here. They zip in and out of traffic, they get in the way, they're very hard to see because they can hide behind another car or a truck. So we don't recommend you jumping in the tuk-tuks. So there are places that you could maybe ride one, but I would not use them on major highways. No, not at all. There is a metro system here that uses trains to get from various parts of the city. However, it's a little bit tricky because there are some cars that only women can be on. There are some cars that are mixed and, and some of that is tied to time of day. And it's really not critical to get on the metro here, but we've had no problem getting overs or walking. So one of the highlights of our visit here has been the coffee shop that we found with the proprietor named Ali. Here, we've had a really hard time finding a great coffee shop and no real bakeries that are really in our area. So this place we wandered up to and they have just taken such good care of us. We need to give them a shout out. The first coffee shop we went into was inside, kind of dark, not a lot of people, and it just didn't feel like a place we could just sit and lounge. There really wasn't a place to sit in there. So when we found this other place, we walk up, he just greets us, sits us down at a table, brings us two water bottles, and then our cappuccinos. Without having to even ask for them. He knows what our standard order is. In fact, today we took a picture with him and he just said, I love you. And he's just been so kind and sweet. That is really what the people here are. So it's one of the best parts of Egypt. Yeah. So the first thing in an actual restaurant that we tried when we were here was molokai. And it is a green soup. It's normally served with chicken and vermicelli rice. It's a lot of food. <laughs> so there's plenty for both of us when we order just one order. Our Airbnb host actually picked up some koshery for us to try. And that was amazing. First time I've ever had it or even heard of it. Breakfast was called Fool. It's a fava bean puree, and I'd heard about it, and I was trying to find where to eat it. And the full breakfast actually comes with uh, falafel and french fries that are seasoned. It's a very tasty meal. There's over a hundred different kinds of bread here. In fact, there's these very big puffy ones, and that's what they consider white bread. But they're very tasty. They taste like a yeast roll. And you'll see those all over. Like, they'll be bakeries every so often and you'll just see racks and racks of bread. 
It's a little disconcerting because a lot of times the racks are just outside and, you know, there's all of the dust. It seems to work. No, one, no one's having a problem with it except us, maybe. And pigeon is really popular here. Stuffed pigeon is usually how you'll find it. There's also tagine. One of his favorite meals is fata. It's very filling. The meat is delicious. It usually has a sauce with it, too, which I really thought was spicy and lovely. We were surprised by how much Italian food you can also find here. I mean, of course, they have all of the American American fast food restaurants sure. and We've pizza avoided places. All those as usual. There's also shisha pipes everywhere. The water pipes. Yeah, they're called hookah in some places. They're constantly being brought out at coffee shops, our favorite coffee shop. Lots of people go there. They sit down with a hookah. They smoke for an hour, you know, and they the attendants will come up, change the car charcoal out. Uh, make sure everything's working right. A lot of restaurants have seating and then also lounge chairs, right. um, couches. They'll ask, do you want to sit on a couch or do you want to sit at a table? So one of our first tours was of the Grand Pyramid and some of the lesser pyramids, the Sphinx. We went to see Saqqara and also Memphis. We'll have prices for everything at the end of the video. We were warned that nearly all of the souvenirs and tchotchkes were made in China. So you may be okay with the fact that you're buying a little whatever. Miniature pyramid or miniature Yes, space, as right? a memory for the event, but yeah. don't expect that it was made here. You can add on a camel ride or a carriage ride. If you want to take a picture with a camel, you have to pay for that as well. Basically everything gets paid for. There's nothing free. Even if somebody says, this is going to be free, it's not. <laughs> In fact, sometimes you'll know because they'll say, this is my courtesy, yes. but then they'll ask for money. <laughs> So when we booked our tickets for the pyramid, there's an entry fee, but there's also a separate fee if you want to walk through the pyramids. We decided we did want to. Now walking is a very broad term for what you have to do because these pyramids were not built for tourists. <laughs> they were built to keep people out basically. And most of the tunnels are inclines. So they have these boards put down with slats across and the height of the passageway is sometimes under five foot. Well under five foot. I always had to bend down. And finally your height is helping. And I hit my head a couple times even though I was trying not to. But you're crawling upwards and these pyramids by nature are well temperature regulated. But when you stick lights in there and all these tourists walking through, they're incredibly hot. So by the time we went through two pyramids on the inside, we were done. We were hot. Our legs were worn out and we were sweating. Because <laughs> every step you take is kind of a mini squad as well. And you're having to navigate people who are coming down when you're coming up and vice versa. Yeah, the ancient Egyptians didn't think about this in and out. You know, they just made one passageway. Not think about tourism at all. How dare they? How dare they? There's nothing really to see inside, but I really thought that it was worth doing. I think it was really worth doing because who doesn't want to say, I walked into the Great Pyramid? We went into one of the older pyramids as part of the Saqqara Memphis tour, which I really recommend you bolting that onto your trip if at all possible. The statue of Ramses II was outstanding. Yeah. I was blown away by the size of it. You actually got tears in your eyes. You were welling up. In one of the lesser pyramids, we were able to go into it and they had said no pictures. However, there was someone inside who would allow us to see certain things, basically was asking for a tip, but showed his flashlight and you could see the alabaster in contrast with just the solid wall. We were in there and he whispered a few things to us. And then he turned off the lights, said, don't tell your guide. And then he showed us the, his flashlight against the wall. In a lot of places we found that even though they say no photographs, it means no free photographs. <laughs> <laughs> The next site that we went to was the Egyptian Museum. We didn't have a guide. We just followed a self-guided tour. And used their website to kind of figure out where things were. Which I highly recommend. We'll link below. And the King Tut exhibit did not allow photos, except when you were inside and there was money being exchanged and then photos were taken with the burial mask. All the little side exhibits, most of the museums are like that. You don't take pictures of those. The rest of the museum usually can take pictures. I recommend the self-guide if you don't hire a tour guide as part of a bigger tour because there really isn't a ton of information about what you're seeing um, on the exhibits themselves. Yeah, the museum doesn't have a path or an organization that's very clear. So yeah, the, the website did help a lot. 
there are two additional museums that you can see. The The main Egyptian museum is amazing and it's very old. Right. The, the next one is much newer and it's the National Museum of Egyptian Civilization. And that one has over 22 mummies and it was very fascinating. We did have a tour guide for that one. The mummies that are in this newer museum, they were actually taken from the, the main museum. And there was a whole parade and a celebration as this was happening. There's information about that too when you visit that museum. Um, the other one that we wanted to see, but it's not quite open yet, is the Grand Egyptian Museum. Okay. And there's uh, currently there's not even a website for it. There's just a third party that is taking down information. It's supposed to be open in April, but there's been a ton of delays. We also went to Old Cairo and got to see the Coptic churches. We saw the Hanging Church. It had a ton of relics. It's called the Hanging Church because it's kind of built between two Roman structures that are part of a fortress. One of the other important areas to visit is the site where the Holy Family hid in Egypt after the threat of King Herod. There's a church that's built over that space, St. Sergius and St. Bacchus Church, and it's also known as Abu Surga. And it also has a protected well of water that the Holy Family supposedly used while they were in hiding for those three months. There's a synagogue that we would have also liked to see. Unfortunately, it was closed for renovation. It's called the Ben Ezra Synagogue, supposedly built on the site where Moses was found. We also visited a couple of mosques. Now, when you visit a mosque, you have to remove your shoes, but they have a person there that's going to take them and store them in little cubbies. And then when you're done with your tour, there's no charge to get in the mosque at all. I mean, basically, you're just tipping the guy to get your shoes. There are a few mosques that you do have to pay for, but they are more museums now because they are so ancient. They're not really operational mosques, although of course you can go there and pray if you would like. And anybody, you don't have to be Muslim, can go in. You uh, just want to be respectful and cover your shoulders and your knees. As a woman, you do not need to wear um, any headscarf. If you're not Muslim, that's fine. We're running out of light, so bear with us. It is prayer time here. <laughs> and as Kevin had mentioned earlier, there is a sound system throughout the city that projects the prayers. So we're trying to be respectful, but we're also running out of light. And it's our last day here. <laughs> <laughs> so as we discussed earlier, a dollar is worth about 30 Egyptian pounds. So when you're pulling out money for something, you might be pulling out 100 pounds and that's just not that much money. Here are a few of the, of the items that we purchased and how much it cost us. We got an entire cone of falafel for four Egyptian pounds. French fries were five Egyptian pounds for a serving. Our cappuccinos in the morning were 20 pounds a piece. And bottled water was four or five pounds a piece on top of that. Nearly everywhere you went, you could get fada for around 250 pounds. Yeah, and we got some really nice high-end meals. Like I got a beautiful steak filet with uh, cheese on top and some mashed potatoes and mushrooms, and it was 420 pounds. And that was probably the most we paid for any specific food or meal. That whole meal was about 1,100 pounds. It cost 200 pounds to get from the Cairo airport to Mohandasin, which was a 45 minute drive. Our full day tour in Cairo was about $154 for our Sphinx and Pyramids tours. It was almost $300 for our full day trip, including all of the entry fees and lunch. And all the tips we're giving are really not that much in American dollars or euros. So tip generously at these places. Our Airbnb for 14 days was $464.68 US dollars. Which is $33.19 a day. So really, really cheap. Really cheap. So Egypt at times was a bit overwhelming. There were so many new sites and new experiences for us to have, but it's been absolutely incredible. There's so much to see here. There's so much to do that we probably could spend a lot more than two weeks here. We're going to be spending another two weeks in Luxor, including a Nile River cruise, and you don't want to miss that episode. We're going to fill you in on all of our experiences there. And if you want to find out more information about everything that we're doing here, go to findingenuinery.com. There's lots of articles and information. Judy's journal. Until next time. Until next time.